Bless your name for the days you gave me my children. Many things would have gone wrong each of those days. I bless your name for the days you gave me my children. Many things would have gone wrong but for your grace. So I bless your name. You are listening to Praying Parent Prayer Group, 3PG Family Radio Broadcast. At 3PG, we are committed to helping parents take spiritual responsibility for the overall welfare of their children. We hope this episode is a blessing to your family. Here is your host, Olumafin Kende Benjamin. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we say thank you. Thank you for your many help. Thank you for how you've been teaching us in righteousness under this title. Thank you for the past this episode. And especially we say thank you for this seventh one. Blessed be your name in Jesus' name. Even as you speak now, please speak to our hearts, speak to our souls, speak to our spirits, speak to our families. And may our life and life of our children be better for it in Jesus' name. Lord, we beg of you, where there are sickness and pain, stretch forth your hand and heal, and may hold right now in Jesus' name. Make us better parents, and make us healthy and fine. Thank you, our Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. In this edition, we shall continue from our title, What Parent Owns Their Children. What Parents Own Their Children. And today, by God's grace, is episode 7. And be focusing on the spirit of vengeance is not the spirit of Christ. The spirit of vengeance is not the spirit of Christ, being the seventh episode under this title. We're taking our test from Genesis 34, from verse 6 to 29. Genesis 34, from verse 6 to 29. We began using this reference in the last episode, and we are continuing for this episode as well, in the story of Diana that went to see the ladies of the land, Eventually, she was defied. And verse 6 of that same Genesis 34 says, And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. You remember, then I went to visit the daughter of the land, as said, to see the daughters of the land, and possibly also to be seen and noticed by the men of Shechem, a family pagan's neighbor. Shechem, the prince of the land, saw her, and eventually defied her, raped her. He may have possibly got engrossed with her beauty and candor, and the thought of not having her, going by the treat moral values her family had been known for, overtook his judgment, and afterward raped her and uh, defied her and kept her without the knowledge of her parents. And eventually the father in this text we have read in verse 6 came with him to come and meet the family of Jacob, so that he can discuss the time of marriage, having to the guest by force to himself. And to his credit, unlike the case of Ammon, the prince of Israel, who defied his own sister several years down the line, and hated her for it in 2 Samuel 13, unlike that, in this case, the prince of Shalem was even willing to go ahead and marry the lady. The victim and the abusers in these two Bible cases suffer the same outcome even though the incident happened several hundred of years apart. And the question one we want to ask is why should a man, be it a prince or ordinary citizen, abuse a woman he so loved? Three reasons quickly came to mind from this question. First was the spiritual disparity in time of faith between the two persons, especially in the case of Dana and Shechem. The disparity in faith the object of worship, both sides are worshipping, 
and the level of the fear of God in the person so involved and in the society where the victim and abuser find themselves. And the second answer that comes to mind is what the Bible calls bad communication, leading to unprofitable friendship and fellowship. And even marriages are built on foundation of unprofitable friendship and fellowship or bad communication, as the Bible will put it, always end in hatred and abuse, like the case of Ammon and Tamar, orchestrated by unmet expectations that defy basic realities. The third is a poor parental upbringing that defines all the character in the two cases, either the case of Shechem and Dana, or the case of Amnon and Tamar, poor parenting came to the forefront as the major reason for the poor judgment in the two cases, and the same in many others that follow thereafter. The abusers and the victim, at least one in each of the two cases, are either the first child or the only daughter of their rich parents and may have been so indulged with privileges above their equal. And verse 7 of our text says, And the sons of Jacob came out of the field, when they heard their sister had been defied, and the father of Shechem and Shechem came to give them the news. And the men were grieved, the son of Jacob were grieved, and they were very wrought. They were very angry, because he has wrought fully in Israel, in line with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And verse 8 say, And how more common with them, saying, The soul of my son, check him long for your daughter. I pray you give her to him for wife. And make him marriages with us, and give us your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. They kept the girl in the house, and are asking for her man in marriage from the parent. It's like they don't have practically have a choice. Your guest is with us, just agree with us, and we keep her for wife, and don't bring her home again. Now, here comes the problem. When the case of rape was reported by Shechem and his family, for reason best known to Jacob, he failed to handle the matter himself. At least we have asked for his daughter to be brought back. But he didn't handle the case himself. He said the son should take over. And the son, who were already bitter and grieved by the news, discussed with Shechem's family and negotiated time of marriage with them on behalf of their sister, who was still in their custody at the time. Which thing is contrary to Jacob's family values and ought not to be done to a woman they so profess to love. And to this, the son of Jacob, their mind was set on revenge. But they knew they were few in number and with less defense mechanisms, and they are not as powerful a nation yet. Then they answer Jacob and his father are more deceitfully with the terms and conditions that will compromise the defense of the abuser and his family. With the man was seeking for opportunity to have their revenge on the man who had defied their sister and kept her to himself like a sweet and harlot, and they so give them their condition for marriage. And verse 11 And Shechem said unto her father Jacob now, and to the brethren, the sons of Jacob, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what you say I should do, I will give. And ask me never so much dowry and gift. Just ask me anything, as little as you can, and I will give according as you shall say unto me. But don't ask too much, but give me your sister to wife. That is the most important. And verse 13 says, And Jacob's sons answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully. They knew what they were doing. They were angry, so they were deceiving in answering them. And because he had defied their sister, Dinah. And here we are the terms and conditions delictable before the two men that came with their family. Verse 14. And they say unto them, We cannot do this thing. You took our sister from us, and now you want us to give in to you for wife, and uh, not even bringing her back yet, but to give our sister to you for wife, and you are uncircumcised. It's a reproach unto us. Verse 14 says that. But in this we consent to you, this is a condition for giving her to you to wife, and remain your custody on a permanent basis. If you will be like us, and that every one of you, every male among you, should be circumcised. If you can circumcise yourself, the king, your son, Shechem, and all male in your country, in your community, in your city, if all can circumcise, then we can agree with you. It is on this verse 16 says, Then we give our daughter unto you, and we take your daughters unto us, and we dwell with you, and we become one people. They want to give their daughters out unto them. And after that time, only Dana was the daughter they have. 
You want that where they want to get the rest from. Maybe they hold the house some other time. And also, they will also get your own daughter to be a wife. Verse 17. But if you not akin to us to be circumcised, and you will not do as we have asked you, that all the men in your city should be circumcised, then we will come to your place and take our daughter, and we will be gone from you. And Shechem could just conceive that. She won the girl by all means. And their west please her more. And Shechem her more son. And the young man, the far north, he waste no time to do the thing they ask. Because he has the light in Jacob's daughter. And he was more honorable than all the house of his father. In other words, he was highly respected. No wonder he didn't even say anything bad in what he did. Verse 20. And Hamor and Shechem his son came unto the gate of their city. And come on with the men of their city, saying they came to the city to come and discuss the time and condition they gave them that all men in the city should be should be circumcised, so that they can marry the girl they want to marry. But let's see how they present the matter. Since he was an honorable man, highly respected, highly placed, it was easy for him to set the idea of circumcision for all adult men in Shechem to the men of the city. What a terrible price, innocent followers. And in this case, the entire community of Shechem pay when their leaders make foolish decisions. And more so, when they lace their arguments with lies, falsehood, and bad intention in order to win all suspecting, gullible followers to their side. Shechem and his father Hamor was not altogether sincere in their argument and their selling the idea to the men of the cities. The son of Jacob, we are into here as well with time and condition the table before them, knowing fully that Shechem and his father will so buy the idea because they want to have the gate to themselves, and by those so doing, pounce on them and have their vengeance. And so we are these two as well, Amor and his son Shechem. They must have had enough time to think over the hard conditions that was given to them, but they are accepted to follow it through, not just because of Dana, their sister, the young prince at Defy. But they wanted also to rob Israel of his hard earned cattle and symbol of wealth in labor for, for over 20 years in Padan Haram. Aside having robbed him his pride and dignity as a father to Dana, in those days, cattle are the major symbol of wealth. And yet, this man and his son set their eyes on those things to rob him of them, having robbed him already of his pride and dignity as a father to Dana and the girl they defy. Hear what they said to these men as they said the idea of them sacrificed to the men. They said to them, These men, referring to Jacob and his son, are peaceable with us. And that is true to some extent. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade their in, for the land, behold, is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. If they are stopped there, it could have been very beautiful. But that enough will convince the men. Having been a respected and horrible man in the land beforehand. Now, hear this. This is where the problem is. Verse 23. If they have stopped where they have gone so far, it could have been very beautiful. And the men could have consented all the same. See what they say. Verse 23. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Hamor and his Shechem, his son, Akin order and went out of the gate of the city. And every male was circumcised, and all that went out of the gate of a city. They agreed with them after they heard that the cattle and the substance and the wealth of uh, Jacob eventually be theirs if they can agree to their terms. They were covetous, and they had intent to rob Israel of his wealth and, uh, and not just of his daughter alone. I mean, the men of the city. And they got circumcised because they had their eyes fixed on the vast cattle of Jacob, a great mouth of substance, far richer and bigger than them. And it came to pass on the third day, verse 25, when they were sore, when the wound was heavy under them, and they couldn't help themselves, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, helped by the other sons as well, took each man a sword and came upon the city boldly and slew and killed. All the male adults, because they were heavy and couldn't defend themselves, and they killed all of them. And they also killed Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword. And now they took Dana out of Shechem's house and they went out. You know, they have kept the girl in the house all the while. They took him from there, took her from there, 
and they went out. Verse 27, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defied their sister. They took their sheep, their oxen, their asses, and all that which was in the city, and that which was in the field, and all their wet, and all their little ones, and all their wives, they took with them as well as captive, and spoiled them, and took all that was in their house. Nothing was left for them. The sons of Jacob, led by Simeon Levi, the son of Leah, the mother of Dinah, had their revenge at the end of the day. Nothing was left, not even their tiny property. When Jacob had it, it was greatly troubled. Why giving the men very hard condition for peace, only to kill them in the moment they couldn't defend themselves, he asked, and make Israel look like a people who couldn't keep inside of a bargain, of a covenant, knowing fully well that that now was not altogether completely innocent. In the whole incident, that brought her an irreparable damage as well. Why should you be the victim and the judge at the same time in your own case? He kept the arrogance in his mind and at his deathbed, he made very unpalatable utterance to Simeon and Levi, the kind of statement every son dread to hear from a dying father who knew God and walked with God. Like Jacob in Genesis 49 verse 5 to 7. Genesis 49 verse 5 to 7. Why should you kill the guilty along with the innocent? Jacob was never happy with the step and the decisions and the action of his sons led by Simeon and Levi. Revenge can be very sweet for a moment, but it's a ravenous wolf who will leave those who are given to it battered and bittered and worse than they were before they fell to his spell. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, give place for offense, give place for disappointments, give place for us. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Romans 12 verse 19. Romans 12 verse 19 says, give place for us. Give place for possible offense that people may offend you and therefore leave vengeance to God. To God. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay everyone, says the Lord. In another place he said, vengeance belongs unto me. Hebrew 10 verse 30. God said that vengeance belongs to me. Hebrew 10 verse 30. To avenge oneself is to be the judge in one's own case. Parents should know this. And children must be told over and again, both in words and in our personal conduct. Vengeance is a sign of distrust in God and very satanic in intent and in action. The entire human story is full of blessed memories, stained with disappointment and betrayals. It's a fact that those whose eyes are covered with vengeance often underplay past memories of good times God has blessed them with and the potential of future fine memories with those they are disappointed with or that offended them. But rather, the enemy will place high emphasis on the present hurt and disappointment they suffered, and they will take action based on that to their own hurt and to the hurt of their potential objects of vengeance. There are no true winners in any act of vengeance. And the truth be told, people will come into your life and part of your life journey and story. And at convenient points, some will leave. That's just the truth. And as they leave, some other person too will take their places in your life. This will surely leave behind sweet fellowship and memories in some instances. And in some others, one, there may be bitter lessons of betrayal to contend with. As much as people will do us good, sure, some other will leave us with bitter peace to show as they take their leave of our lives. On our part two, each one of us, no matter how careful we try to live our lives, and try to conduct our actions at our best, there will be people who will be hurt even at our best. And with the best intention at heart, when we least want to hurt them, and there will be people too, we shall live their life for others to step in as well, leaving behind for them sweet memories of ourselves as parting gifts they will cherish for a long while, and some bitter pill, as the case may be, these things are part of life, and should be thought of each time we nurse the idea of revenge for whatever reason. God should be the judge at all times. No matter the trouble, children must be told, and parents must know this as well. There is no one that people don't live their lives. There are, there are people you were in their life at some point, and you left, and you added some new ones, some new people to your life. 
people will leave you and some new person will be added to you also. New friends will be added to you and at some point, some old friend will leave you. Some at great personal cost, you must have offended people in the past just as much as people have offended you as well. It is part of life. To sit down at some point and refusing to let go of hurt and disappointment is not just wrong, it is a sign of weakness and it's a route to the many positions if not check. Letting go of your hurts and disappointment so as to embrace your today and make room for a greater and better tomorrow is a sign of strength and spiritual maturity. This is also true for church and ministry. Many of us have been in one church or another before we pitch our tent to where we are now. We should to stay where we are there. And at our own time, we left. But the church or the ministry still goes on. Same is our individual lives. People will leave and more will be added to help us at some point or to strengthen us through their disappointment or bitterness they left behind when they are living as a journey through life. Some of this in and that movement will sure come at some personal price, but to take up the position of a judge and callously avenge ourselves is to play God. Revenge is not of God. It's never of the Spirit of Christ. It makes those given to it sick and mentally incapable of sound reasoning. The Spirit that seeks opportunity to steer down, destroy, and kill as a result of past or present hurt is of the devil. It may be your spouse. It may be any of the children. Maybe your friend, an old friend, or relative, or somebody in your workplace, the spirit that looks for opportunity to tear down and destroy others as a way of taking revenge because of hurt or disappointment in the past or even in the present. That kind of a spirit is never of God. It's a sign of demonic possession to seek and to last opportunity to avenge oneself. To take revenge by oneself, like the son of Jacob, led by Simeon and Levi did, is to declare personal war against God. When under the influence of demons of revenge, every evil thing is possible, and insincerity and lies are high. And the end of those given to revenge is never better than their beginning. That someone fell out of favor with you today does not mean the person cannot be of any future benefit in some other unlikely way tomorrow. This is an important lesson every believer should embrace and teach others, especially our children. Never underestimate the power of a greater tomorrow and never completely close the door of reconciliation and progress. Follow peace with all men, say the Bible, April 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man can seize the Lord. There is no holiness where there is no peace. It must be peace and holiness put together. God, April 12, verse 14. God is the real judge and judgment should be left for him. He sees all, he knows all, and he can judge all. No one has a right to judge another in a case you are also a victim. True permanent judgment is of God. There is no better and children must be told this over and over again and parents too, please know it. There is no better reason for a woman to wish death for a man than to be raped by that man. Take advantage of her innocence and use her. But even when that it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Romans 12 verse 19. Romans 12 verse 19. And that in itself is a message of caution. Try not to find yourself in a position where you can't help being abused. At least we are and went to your power to control it. Dina had things under her wings, but she laid down her guard through unguarded curiosity and ended up being alone with the wrong man at the wrong time where help was far from her. In many cases of abuse, like in the case of Dina, the one being abused is not entirely goodless. Yes, no reason whatsoever can justify what Shechem did. But we cannot but state as well that Dana triggered the chain reactions that led to her being raped by unguarded visit to see the daughters of the land and possibly for the men of the land too to see her. An idle hand with an idle plenty of time to play with among idle and frivolous friends is a perfect breeding ground for abuse. Hear this again. An idle hand with plenty idle time to play with among idle and frivolous friends is a perfect ground for abuse. We own our children this great lesson. Please, parents, don't forget that. Parents must warn and train their children, especially the female child, 
against such unnecessary visits and may children also must be taught that taking undue advantage of the women in their lives, even if they had the power and the opportunity to do so, is not the best at any time. Unremorseful abusers like Shechem and Amnon always had to pay heavy price for uncontrolled sexual behavior in an unexpected ways and when they lead and when they least expected it. But it's not in the power of any one of us to take vengeance and make others pay for their crime. Whoever does that plays God and is guilty as in one who abuses him or her. The way to healing therefore and hate and complete restoration for victim of abuse, disappointment and hurts and those that even causes is to forgive and let go. To forgive others even when it ought to do so is not a sign of weakness but strength. It takes strength of the spirit inspired by the spirit of Christ to forgive those who cause you harm and hurt you and to accept forgiveness as well and let go also takes strength from the same spirit of Jesus Christ. Grace to forgive and the humility to give and accept forgiveness is only possible in Christ Jesus and in him is true healing and peace no matter the hurt. To forgive others or to accept forgiveness and healing won't automatically eradicate past memories that brought about disappointment in the first place, but it will heal the hurt and the pain, and it will give peace and rest to the heart of those that are hurt, and the rest you lead for God to do. Where there is no grace, man will hold on to hurt to his own disadvantage. But those who have received and believed in the grace of Jesus Christ they will not only avoid the errors of Simeon, Levi, and Absalom, who gave themselves over to the spirit of vengeance, but shall be blessed in time with peace and rest, as they allow Jesus Christ to take his way and allow grace to have his way, and they forgive and let go. Don't look for opportunity to avenge yourself, and don't keep the hurt in your heart perpetually. You'll be hurt, and it's to your own disadvantage if you do that. And another day, if you allow peace to reign, you see forgiveness or you receive forgiveness, or you give forgiveness, and you allow peace and rest of Jesus Christ, it's grace to be in your heart. Then I can tell you a standing ovation of heaven, led by the Son of God himself, Jesus Christ, the righteous, awaits you in timeless eternity, as he did for Stephen in Acts 7, verse 54 to 60, Acts 7, 54 to 60. This we must teach regularly in all our families. Let us pray. Father, I beg of you, give us the grace to let go our hearts and our disappointment, to forgive those who wrong us, and also accept forgiveness from those we have wronged. Father, please help us to forgive others, to have peace in our mind, to receive forgiveness, and to allow peace to reign in our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. As long as God keep you training and educating your children in all this area I mentioned, in this episode and do before it as a way they should live and appropriate for them is your topmost priority. It is the way ordained by God that should teach and instruct our children consistently and regularly too, through the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ in us as believer and as praying parents. If you do it right with a heart that wholly and solely devoted to God. Then from those hearts will be issues of life, wisdom and grace to teach and train as appropriate by time. Children that will bring glory to God and joy to our family, to the priest of Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May God put his name upon your children and bless them. Amen. And may God help you to so train your children that hearts and support me can sometimes be part of life. The earlier we let go and we embrace peace, forgive others or receive forgiveness from others and forgive forgiveness ourselves in some cases. The earlier we do that, the earlier we enjoy peace and the earlier we allow the Spirit of Christ to rule our life. Vengeance is never of God. Don't take law into your own hand. God bless you. Amen. I believe you have been blessed. It's been Praying Parents Prayer Group Christian Ministry, 3PG Radio Broadcast. Join us same time on this same station next week. For prayer, counseling, and inquiry about the group or on today's topic, or to join and participate 
in our free online prayer conference, 11 p.m. every Tuesday from the comfort of your room. Kindly call or send SMS or WhatsApp message to 081-340-16069. 081-340-16069. You can also email us at 3pgprayingfamilies at gmail.com. And you can also visit our website www.3pgchristianministry.org for more family-oriented Christian materials that can make you the kind of parent you are called to be. Until next week at 3PG, we are committed to helping parents take spiritual responsibility for the overall welfare of their children.